of the What If Foundation to talk about what's happening with the work of the foundation in Haiti. So if you'd like to move closer, please do. And I will now hand it over to Margaret. Thank you, Janet. I'm so happy to be able to be with you today at the very beginning of the year at Epiphany and so close to the third anniversary of the earthquake that struck Port-au-Prince on January 12th, 2010. So I think over the next week you'll be reading in the paper more about Haiti and what's happening. Perhaps you read the New York Times article that came out on Christmas Eve, a very long article trying to explain what's happened to all the money that was donated to Haiti. Why are there still so many people outside suffering? Why has so little been done when there was so much attention on this country? And here we are three years later and things are worse for the majority of Haitians. So I'm going to address some of that later, but I just thought I would begin. Okay, I, you can it be a little bit louder? I don't, they're going to make it louder in the back. How's that, Char? Is that good? So I thought I would share pictures today and share the story of the What If Foundation and how we got started, which many of you know because you've been with me on this journey the whole way, which is about to complete 13 years of work on this project and we're about to start our 14th year. But I thought I would just bring you through because it is a journey. And I so appreciated the service this morning, the focus on light in the darkness, the focus on being that light and recognizing light in the world despite the obstacles and the darknesses and the injustices and the things that make us wonder where the light is. And that today, the service was so beautiful that it just is such a testament to the presence of light no matter how great the darkness. And I feel that Haiti is one of those examples. And this project that this congregation has supported over the years is certainly an example of that. So I'm going to begin with this slide, Saint Jude au Secou, which means Saint Jude help, S-O-S. And my first trip to Haiti was 13 years ago in January, 13 years ago this month, a United Church of Christ minister, Brian Sergio from Wisconsin, where I was living, brought me to Haiti on a two-week trip. The trip changed my life in that it introduced me to a scope of poverty and a, a depth of challenge that I had only seen statistics on but had not had personal contact with. And it really broke open my heart. There was one day during that trip that we went to a church, St. Clair's Church, in the T-Plus Caso neighborhood of Port-au-Prince. And this church was packed, it was overflowing. These steps in the front we had people standing outside. There was singing, there was music, not from instruments, but from people's voices and clapping. And you could tell there was a lot of energy. There was a lot of light. There was a lot of hope. And this was coming out of this church after I'd spent a week volunteering at the Mother Teresa Home for the Destitute and the Dying, where people went there to die because they didn't have the money to go to the hospital to get medication that could certainly cure them. And so I was very depressed, and I was really struggling, and I was wondering where the light was in the midst of all these challenges. I was feeling guilty because my refrigerator was stuffed to overflowing, and, and food was just rotting because I thought I was going to go on a diet and eat salad and instead it was rotting because I didn't feel like it and so I was just constantly trying to lose weight and here I was in a country where people were starving because they didn't have anything to eat and so a lot of things inside of me surfaced and there were a lot of emotions and a lot of confusion and I just didn't know what to do, how to respond because here I lived in Berkeley and this is thousands of miles away, and I did not speak Creole, and I couldn't remember the French I'd studied in high school, and I was a single mom at the time, and I had my own business and my son in first grade, and how was I gonna 
respond, and the problems felt way too big for any one person to do anything about. And then we went to this church, and there is a priest in this church, Father Jean Juste, who led the group in prayer. And there was so much praying, so much of the service was prayer, like the women that we heard at the beginning on that video. And people with their eyes closed and the children standing on top of the pews and arms over their heads and swaying back and forth. And it was all in Creole, so I didn't understand a word. But I could feel the light that was present in that congregation. And I could sense the hope that was there. And what I'd seen outside, the garbage piled six feet, seven feet high and, and people looking for food to eat and some of them needing to eat dirt because that's all they had, clay from the ground that was put together into what they called a dirt cookie, mixed with a little bit of oil and water and salt, and then sold. That costs money, a, a penny or two, because there's minerals in this clay from the middle of Haiti. Minerals, something other than nothing. And so that mothers and fathers would buy those dirt cookies for their children so at least they would have some minerals. That's what they were eating. And I had just flown from SFO. And so if you could imagine the SFO airport and then flying into Port-au-Prince and then driving through that city and then seeing people who are eating the dirt cookies because that's all they've got. And then seeing that there isn't running water and there aren't toilets and, and, there's, and the, the roads at any moment you could drop into a pit and there were little kids walking about and there are many orphans and it just was this overwhelming disaster it seemed. And then I went to this church and there was such deep faith. You could feel it. It was palpable. There was so much praying. And what they were saying was Saint Jude au secours. And this is a Catholic congregation. And in the Catholic tradition, I discovered that St. Jude is the saint that you pray to when there is no other recourse, when it's an impossible situation. And that St. Jude and Jesus together would create some sort of miracle, some sort of way out, some sort of light, some way. And so they pray to St. Jude, O Siku, which when I was in that service, I walked up to somebody who spoke a little bit of English and greeted me when I sat down. And I said, what does Osaku mean? Because the whole congregation was saying Osaku. And the woman looked at me, and she just put her finger up, and she drew three letters. She went like this, S, O, S. That's what it means. And so I was there on this two-week trip, knowing that the experience would break open my heart and be an opportunity to give. And I was really searching at that time for healing myself on the inside and thought that by helping others that it might help me heal. Because my husband had passed away a year before. He was only 36 years old and I was 34. And I was so stopped by that experience, so devastated by that loss that all my goals and the fast pace that I was on and building a business and, and being an entrepreneur and, and putting my son in, in kindergarten, he had just started and I was on this fast paced 30 something track and Rich's death just stopped me. And I was searching for a way out and that's what brought me to Haiti that first time. I hadn't studied Haiti in college. I didn't know very much about it. I'd read about the boat people that try to make their way from Haiti to Miami and a lot of the boats break apart and I'd read that people had died in their efforts to get here. I knew that there was an unstable political situation in Haiti. I remember hearing about the Devaliers, the dictators there and their very awful and scary Tantan Makuts, which was an army not to protect people from outside, but to control the poor majority in Haiti. I learned a little of that, but nothing had prepared me for that level of poverty and all the children that reminded me of my son, Luke, who used to go to Sunday school here at FCCB. And so, Saint Jude Osaku, help, S-O-S, right to me. She came right to me, and right in my eyes, she drew out those letters. And I, 
I really, I have chills right now telling you, and this is 13 years ago, but I felt like, how can I close my eyes? I felt like God had spoken through her to me saying, Margaret, wake up. Just an hour and a half flight from Miami on American Airlines, this is happening. Here are people of faith praying to God for help, and you heard it. You didn't hear it in a documentary or hear it in an article. You heard it face to face. She's inches from you. They are crying out help. And so that was what began this journey, and I had no idea how to help. But the prayers were with me and in my mind, and I prayed for a way to respond. I didn't know how. And this priest, Father Jean Just, was the one who was leading those prayers. And I didn't realize at the time that a few days later he would come to speak to our group. What I didn't know is that in Haiti, he was considered the Martin Luther King of Haiti. He was considered the person who spoke out on behalf of the poor, who had the courage to speak out against the foreign policy and economic policies that were creating the poverty that were killing so many people and creating such misery for others. He spoke out, and he told me when I got to know him later that he always felt that Jesus was walking with him his whole life, even when he was a little boy, that there was a presence. He could feel it. He sensed it. And Jesus' teachings of love, Jesus' teachings of reaching out to those who are the most vulnerable, to respond to those who are hungry, who are thirsty, who are imprisoned, that those were the teachings that guided him. And so he led his congregation in prayer, in a prayer for help, that God would send help to their lives. And throughout the trip, I visited a place called City Soleil, which Mother Teresa called the most impoverished spot on earth when she visited Haiti before her death. And this is about five miles from where that church is. But that's where the dirt cookies were eaten, most of them there. And these were the homes that people were living in, this grandmother and mother and child. And it was built on a garbage dump, so children don't, their parents don't have enough money for shoes, or they may just have one dress to wear, and they would search for scraps of metal and other things in the garbage to be able to build their houses and to find something to eat. And this picture of this mother and her child, I put this in here because I felt her face summarized what I saw when I was going around in this van just looking. So this United Church of Christ member, grown up in the UCC, my father's United Church of Christ minister, from Berkeley in a van driving throughout Port-au-Prince witnessing this face to face and I just didn't know what to do. Bon Dieu Combay Men Li Pakon Sapere is a Haitian phrase that I learned when I was there. It means God gives but doesn't divide it up. And it's what the Haitian people told me the way they look at God is that God gives all, that there's enough on the planet given to us as human beings to provide for everybody. So that God is the provider of all, but is not in charge of dividing it up. And so they do not blame God for their hunger. They don't blame God for the economic policies that have put their farmers out of business as United States rice floods in much cheaper than the rice that the Haitian farmers make, which then put the Haitian rice farmers and cocoa farmers and corn farmers and bean farmers out of business. <coughs> so they don't blame God. So the faith that I witnessed in these people was something that I was just so moved by. And I tried to understand when you're watching your child die, when you're having to give them clay biscuits, when they don't have the opportunity to go to school, when there's coup d'etat after coup d'etat to overthrow the democratically elected government, a coup d'etat sponsored by the United States, supported by the United States that came out later. When these things happen, external forces that come to make things so incredibly difficult to make a living, when this happens over and over and over again, over the course of Haiti's 200 year history, and yet the church is packed and the people are praying and they're praying out to God for help and they are 
praying for miracles and they know they're not alone and they believe that God is watching, walking with them and I wondered how can they when this is the environment they live in? And that's when Father Jean Juice told me, well, they believe in a God that is present with them in their pain. They believe in a God that knows and weeps with them in their suffering. They believe in a God that gives all to the world, but where it is human beings who have the free will in how to divide it up. So that's where the change needs to happen. That's what they believe. And Father Jean Juice told me that in the presence of suffering, in the presence of grief, the presence of God is felt more and more. And when he said that, I knew a little what he was talking about because I knew what it was like to feel so lost, to feel so grief-stricken, to feel like my life as I thought it was blown away in a second as Rich took his last breath, unexpected asthma attack that he died of. And I remember that that was the opening of my heart to a deeper relationship with God. That's where the definition of how things worked that I had learned in church and pieced together over time wasn't big enough to hold the grief that I had felt. I needed to expand my view of God's presence in my life. I, I needed to change and I felt like that experience of Rich's death was transformative and that it just broke open the way I thought things worked and allowed me to just be open to the mystery. And during those times of great grief when I felt so alone, those were some of the times that God's presence felt more real than ever before. So I understood what John Juice was telling me a little bit. And I asked the question, how do we divide it up then better? How do we do that? How did regular people do that? People who aren't part of the World Bank, people that aren't part of these, the governments, people that don't make economic policies besides our votes and our placards, how do we do that? And he shared a vision he had for a food program. He quoted Matthew 25, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. He said that that passage had always inspired him and shared a vision for a food program for hungry children in his community. And when he shared that during that talk, after we went to the service, during those two weeks of witnessing what I witnessed, there was something that lit up inside of me. It did feel like a light, a spark, what Pat was describing in the service before in her sermon. There was something that went, what if I could help him with that food program? And I didn't know what that would involve, and I didn't know how to do that. But the fact that there were children that were hungry and that he could see the possibility of a food program but didn't have the resources for it felt something that had possibilities. Perhaps I could help provide those resources. And Matthew 25 was the guide, that there were those who were hungry and that there was the opportunity to be able to feed them. That was the path we followed. This is the inside of St. Clair's Church and a painting that my brother Paul, who lives in Sonoma, painted over the different visits that I went to Haiti. He came with me two or three times and he painted this Jesus in the back. And Father Jean Juste said to Paul, it was all a yellow wall. He said, I had this inspiration this morning that there should be a resurrected Christ on the back of the church. And Paul was standing there looking at this black, this, this you know, blank wall that's just yellow in the back and saying, well, Father Jean Juice, you don't understand, but I do really small paintings, oil paintings, and they usually take me three or four or five years to complete, maybe longer. So I am not the person, perhaps there's somebody else. And he said, oh, but God sent you, you're an artist. I just had this vision. And he just said, Barry, go get some charcoal. And this little boy just kind of disappeared and then came back with this rickety ladder and this little piece of charcoal, handed it to Paul, who then found himself going to the back wall and leaning this and doing his first ever, first and only, big painting that over the course of the, the three-day weekend that we were there, this painting was completed. And I have to tell you that he may have completed one painting since then, and this was 12 years ago. So it did feel like a Haitian miracle. 
And here is Father Jerry and myself. Jesus is my boss, is his hat. That was his favorite hat. And we really just stepped into it. I did not know what I was getting into. And I think that perhaps that's why I was there to hear that SOS, because I hadn't studied how complicated it is to do work internationally or how to develop a nonprofit so that you have funding that's ongoing or how to work in this kind of way over time. I didn't know how challenging it would be, what it would require. All I knew is that there was a way to respond and light that was just beaming out from that church and from Father Jean Jus as the leader and that there was great hope. In the first email that I received after this food program started, Father Jean Jus, this just appeared in my home in Berkeley and I was just stunned because it, you know, I have like a hundred emails and I'm going through them and then suddenly this one pops up. It's the first time that I had heard from him since we, uh, some initial seed money was sent down and he goes, dear Margaret, the program is wonderful. I just want to let you know that it's working beautifully. From 200 participants last Sunday, it has doubled today. We've been called to a big assignment from God in feeding the hungry brothers and sisters. The news is being spread. Children and their parents are pouring on us. I use many volunteers. Many youngsters want to help. I'm using the rectory quarters. I need more chairs, more tables, more food, more of everything. The supervisor of the program is a great woman who loves this volunteer task. There is great hope. Now I'm exhausted, it's getting late, it's too much, too exciting to count and report all now. Best regards, Jerry. So that email came out of nowhere and I was so excited that I, spread, I sent it out and some of you received it and responded with sending some resources that we then directed down to Haiti that then paid for the food from farmers at the farmer's market and then members of Father Jean Jus' congregation put the food together and these were the first cooks, Mami Det and Nenen. My son Luke and I spent a summer with them and I've visited many times and we are always together, but they were the first volunteers. They volunteered their time at the beginning. Now we're able and have been for years to pay stipends to all of the cooks so that it's providing income and it's been a reliable income so they can send their children to school. But Mami Det and Nenen started and Nenen created this delicious stew outside their house because they had a stove, and it was rice and beans and vegetables and garlic and Haitian spices, and I thought that maybe this initial seed money might last longer if it was just rice and beans, but they wanted it to be a celebration of food, a celebration of Haitian food, and to have it be a feast, just a delicious meal that the children would remember all week long, because it was just one meal a week that was served on Sundays, just one meal. And that way, the money would spread out over time. And it allowed me time to raise money for then that next Sunday meal. So we started out very, very small. And once a week, the bowls were filled with rice and beans and food. And Father Jerry would walk the streets and invite hungry children to come and to sit and to be part of the celebration of giving and receiving. The food was only provided because people had donated money through me and the foundation that I decided to create called What If? Because I like those words because they're about possibility. What if we could help them feed their children? What if children had enough to eat? What if the world's priorities changed so that food and water and shelter and health care and peace were the priorities? What if? So it was about that question. And so I thought, what a good name for a foundation. And so the What If Foundation is the name. And some of you sent resources, and First Congregational Church, as a congregation through your outreach committee, has sent resources, and the, and the Christmas offering and the alternative gift catalog are all part of it. And this is what, among other people around the country that have given, that's what has allowed us to be here 13 years later. And the children came, and the word was spread, and hundreds came. And each year it grew, more and more children coming. In 2004, 
we expanded to two days a week, and then a year later to three days a week, and then a year later to four days a week, and then five days a week of meals. As I was able to spread the word to more people and more resources came. And Father Jean Juice was able to identify more people and another cooking crew to be able to make all those meals. I have a family of three. I'm remarried, my husband Tom, me, and my son Luke. To cook for three is, I consider it an accomplishment for dinner. <laughs> this congregation cooks now for 1,200 people a day and has for years, five days a week, a meal for 1,200. And the pots and the pans and the preparation and the serving day after day after day. This boy, I put this picture in because it looks like he's walked a long way for that meal. Some children walk five miles from City Soleil, those pictures I showed you earlier, to eat and then walk back. Some of them have red hair like this girl, which would show that there's signs of malnutrition. And there are always more children and hurricanes and the earthquake and so many things. And there were times that we just, I, I would wonder, oh, we're not addressing the reasons why they're hungry and there's all these challenges and what, how do we move forward? And Father Jean Juice taught me these words, which to me are the most important words of my life. Petit, petit n'arrivé, which means little by little, we will arrive. What the Haitian people have taught me is that the small steps matter. The little things matter. Each little bit matters. One meal matters. One scholarship matters. One prayer matters. It all matters. And I feel like, especially in the United States, where big and better and faster and more is kind of our, can be kind of a cultural mantra, that the we might psych ourselves out or feel like, what can I do? I'm just one person. Or that little idea I had doesn't really matter because it's too small. Or it's not grand enough. Or it doesn't address this issue or that issue. And we can talk ourselves out of all sorts of inspirations, I feel, to help bring more love and peace to the planet. And the Haitians have taught us and teach us that every little bit matters. And so this little food program grew over the years and nourished a whole generation of children who now, when they came, may have been two or three years old like this boy, and now it's 13 years later, and they're teenagers, and they're able to do better in school because they had the nutrition when they were younger, and they're healthier now and able to contribute to their community because of that meal, which has grown, as I said, over the years, as have school scholarships, because shortly after the meal started, Father Jean, you said he had a vision for a school scholarship program. He's lots of visions. I was like, what a great idea. And thankfully, somebody gave $1,000, I remember, and I was like, well, that's enough for four scholarships. And so we started with four. And I said, but I don't know if I'll have the money to put them in school next year. He said, it doesn't matter, they'll at least have one year. They'll have one year of education, they'll know to read and write a little bit more. And over the years, we've always been able to put the children back in school, and this year there were about 190 scholarships and we've had about 200 for the last few years for students, as well as a summer camp and an after-school program to help teach them skills to be able to earn an income. This is a picture of Father Jean Just after he was released from prison after the coup d'etat in 2004. He was an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience because he spoke out against the coup and the de facto government that was put in power in Haiti, supported by the United States, and he was arrested after that to silence him and he was in prison twice for several months. And then in 2009, he died. He passed away of a lung disorder that the doctors could not figure out what it was. And we wondered if the What If Foundation could continue without him as the spiritual leader of that congregation and the one who was overseeing and coordinating things on the other end. And yet, when he passed away, nine years of meals and school scholarships and the summer camp had taken place, and all the people that he had empowered with leadership to run those programs were still there and determined to continue, and so they stepped up. And one of his close friends, a Haitian man from Miami, moved, left everything in Miami, his job, his apartment, everything, to move down to run the programs. I love this picture because you can see that it's an indescribable joy, was that the theme of, of the service, that he just is smiling and he's standing there, and there's that cross, and this is where he said, Margaret, we've just 
built a chapel, the St. Jude Chapel, and we're going to have our first worship service. I want you to come see it. And I came, and I'm standing there here saying, where is it? Like, where's the chapel? He said, it's right here. We poured the floor yesterday. It's dry. We don't know where the money for the walls are coming from. We don't have the pews or the communion table, but we have a floor and the cross, and they begin. So I learned a lot from that that really helped us after the earthquake three years ago. By that time, we'd had 10 years of the meals and the scholarships and the education programs for the children in this partnership with this community that Father Jean Juice led. And the kitchens didn't collapse during the earthquake, and nobody died. They'd been working on the programs. They all lived and were able to rise up and serve thousands of people after the earthquake. Within five days, we figured out a way to get food and water in through the Dominican Republic because all, everything had shut down in Port-au-Prince because it had been destroyed. And over 200,000 people died in just a few seconds, 30 seconds. People moved into tent camps right away, and if you read in the paper this week, they'll probably say it's about 400,000 of them are still living outside in the mud under ripped tarps and ripped sheets and tents because there's not been any housing for them. And this is one of the tents that was near the St. Clair's church at the time, which you can see is not going to protect them from Hurricane Sandy, which blew through, Hurricane Isaac, which blew through, another hurricane, Hurricane Thomas, which blew through since the earthquake and the torrential rain that's just part of, of the weather in Haiti. This is the scene outside the St. Clair's Rectory when the first trucks funded by the What If Foundation came through to bring aid, the only aid that this neighborhood saw. Even though it's so close to the airport, the aid didn't get to them. It wasn't dispersed, but thankfully we had this program, so thousands were kept going and alive through it, and a longer line of children waiting. This is February 1st, 2010, when that picture was taken. Menan Pilchai Palu means many hands make the load lighter. And that's how this has been able to happen. And you're part of those hands. This is a beautiful Haitian phrase that celebrates community, that celebrates everybody coming together, celebrates all of us doing the bit that we can, and that that makes the load lighter. And even them knowing that this congregation supports them, that, there is, that you're part of their prayers, that you're part of their lives in this way through your Christmas offerings and other gifts that you give individually and collectively, that makes the load lighter. They know that they're not alone. They know that there are people praying and thinking of them far away. And buying the water and the food, as in this picture, on the 17th of January, so just five days after the earthquake. This is Lavaris, Father Jean Juice, good friend in Miami, who left everything to come down, and he's unloading the truck. He's still there overseeing and organizing. He has an MBA, which has come in very handy as he's created a nonprofit for this organization and these programs and, and is managing and coordinating a wonderful staff of cooks and educators to keep things going, to keep the children fed and alive, the elderly too. And every time I go and I'm able to pass out those plates, I do think of you and the reason that they're those plates is because there's the generosity, the giving of people here in this congregation and throughout the United States. That's the, the What If Foundation, that's the only where we get our money and we're the only source of funding for these programs, so they wouldn't happen without that. This is one of the students that we sponsored over the years who's getting her medical degree. And she was about to start medical school when the earthquake struck. So it didn't start, obviously, but but we were able through connections to have a nonprofit that connected with doctors in Turkey come in. So that's a doctor from Turkey, from Istanbul. And Natalie is there working with him. And she had learned some English through some of the courses that we paid for. And so she was translating from Creole to English. And there was one doctor who spoke English and Turkish. So then he translated to her. And then the other doctor would then, and so like three languages going back and forth. Muslim and Christian side by side, male and female side by side, three different languages. It was this example of the world coming together in unity to be able to serve those who needed help after the earthquakes. And here are some of the doctors with Natalie, who, and because of their kindness and how they mentored her, is so devoted to finishing her degree. She has one more year and then being a doctor in this community, which needs it so badly. The children continue to go to school, the after school program, continues, cooking classes, classes for children, a lot of light that's brought to this community. 
to bring you up to date just briefly, after Father Jean Joux died, there was a new priest that was brought to St. Clair's, and he had a different vision for how the St. Clair's rectory should be used. He moved into it, and he asked the programs to leave. And so in April of 2010, just four months after the earthquake, the doors were locked on the rectory, so the, so the school pro, uh, classes, after school classrooms had, were shut down, and we needed to rent something not far away so that they could continue. He said the food program could stay for a while, but that it would need to leave, and he, the food, pro, food program doors were locked in September of 2011, so for the last year and a quarter, it's been under a tent on this land that we purchased, thankfully able to purchase about a mile away, so the same children and some other children from a tent community go there to eat. And the stoves, they took them with, they were able to saw them across and walk out with them because we bought them and take whatever we could from the rectory since the doors were gonna be closed and they set them up on the side of the head cook's house, Rosie, who has a pretty stable home and so the cooks cook there. And then they use food from the farmer's market so it helps support the Haitian economy. Then this truck is rented, these very strong men carry food for 1,200 people through all of these heavy metal things to underneath a tent where it is served up and dished out, and this is our tent as I saw it when I was there last a few months ago, and I brought down that tarp because the tarp was leaking and everybody was getting wet under the tarp tent, and it's obviously not sustainable. You can see in the background over there, there's a tent community, so there are thousands of people who live right next door, and many of those children come to the food program, and I'm there serving the meals, and you can see I'm wet because we're getting wet underneath. But the children are eating, and Rosie and her cooks are determined to continue to feed them. And they take some home to share with other siblings or parents, aunts and uncles. So part of the meal usually is brought back. The after school program is going on in the temporary situation of that place we've rent, been able to rent on a blackboard. And this saying, l'espoir fait vivre, hope makes life lives within this community despite all of the challenges and being kicked out of the rectory. And that Jesus painting, that beautiful painting I showed you, has been painted over by Father Charles. So it's not there. Although everybody says, you know, Jesus is always there, even though he's painted over. And when they came and told me, they said, Margaret, we're so sad to tell you that Jesus has been deleted. <laughs> that was their English translation, deleted from the church. And there are many different ways you could look at that. But Jesus' teachings are alive, and there is a light that's shining. And we're so grateful to Martin Hammer, who lives in Oakland, who's a member of Builders Without Borders. And through serendipitous, miraculous connections that led us to him, because he and his team of engineers and architects have designed a building for that land, using all Haitian labor, materials purchased in Haiti, and putting a lot of people to work as we have begun the project, even though we have several hundred thousand dollars still to raise to be able to complete it. We had enough to begin. So kind of like that St. Jude Chapel when Father Jean was worshiping on it when the floor was poured. He taught me that and so our board of directors and our small staff now, we have two people who are employees and I've been a full-time volunteer from the beginning, but we just decided to step forward in faith. We called it a campaign of faith because we're raising money to keep the programs going while we're raising money to build a safe place for the programs and also a school, which is Father Jean Joux's vision. This is how they mix cement in Haiti. There are no cement trucks. And these women carry water from the house that we're renting where the blackboard was to the land because there's no water on the land. So this is the water that's carried. And they're part of the crew and getting paid. And at, there's a long line of people every day that is hired to be able to help. This is a stonemason. Martin said he's one of the best in Haiti, he feels. He's done such an amazing job on the security wall that surrounds this property. And so through the cement being passed bucket to bucket, person to person, little by little, that is how the wall and the structure is being built. I wanted you to see this picture because this is a tent next door in the tent community. And this is a man that lives there. And Martin Hammer, the architect, took this picture because he was so moved by it, and so was I, and that this man is creating a stained glass window on the side of his tent. 
making it beautiful, something. That's all he has. That's where his family's lived since the earthquake, for three years outside on the ground. That's all he's got, and he's creating something with it. And he had colored sheets uh, behind it, Martin said. And I just put that in there because there is that spirit, that light that is there in these challenges. And something for us all to be inspired by. Here's the wall, so it's, it's been complete, and we'll, later this month we'll break ground on the kitchen and cafeteria so it can move from being underneath that ripped tarp. These are some children watching next door, and I put this in because they look excited. Something's being built. You'll read in the New York Times article and other articles that very little has been built since the earthquake. There have been three luxury hotels, though. One by, called the Royal Oasis that the Bush Clinton Fund has paid for a portion of. And this luxury hotel, the thought is that then people who have money that might want to invest in Haiti don't want to stay in Haiti unless there's a luxury hotel. So they need to be removed from the poverty to Petchenville, this town up on the hill, to the Royal Oasis Hotel to be able to discuss how they're going to help Haiti separate themselves. And so earthquake relief money has been used to pay for that hotel. And the Red Cross is considering building a luxury conference center and hotel with earthquake relief money. Wow, that man is putting a stained glass window on his tent and these children are living in theirs. These are some of the things that have happened. Through it all, Father John Juice is remembered though in his vision of justice for the poor and food and education and opportunity for the children. And we brought down pictures of him and these children hold that remembering him and the buildings that will be built will be in his memory. This is me down there in La Varese, who's Father Jean Ju's friend, a Haitian farmer who we're working with in a particular project to grow corn near where the programs are, and Jean-Marie Noel, who is the education coordinator, and then Caitlin, who's the executive director of What If, together holding hands, which really symbolize, I think, what this effort has been. It's a partnership, and the reason these programs work is because the Haitians run them, because their vision for a food program, followed by education, followed by after-school program and summer camp, ways to teach children things that could help them earn an income, that has led the programs, and we've met them there in a spirit of partnership, collaboration, deep respect, faith, hope, and love. And little by little, thanks to you and many others, there is some light in this one spot of Port-au-Prince with these programs that do work in our helping give children an opportunity to be alive from nutrition and also to have some dreams and to be educated and to believe that they too can contribute to help their country. And that's been the beauty, little by little, of these programs.